Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Davidson. I'm the Community and Program Coordinator at the Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities. First, I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. These past few months have presented all of us with immense challenges, but I am encouraged every day um, during my various calls and emails with members about the actions they are in, that they are considering or have already enacted. Leaders are dispelling the myth that higher education moves at a slow pace. Rapid, meaningful, and intentional decision-making is occurring across the entire network. It has to. It is imperative that we support young people and their complex needs and challenges. The work of supporting opportunity youth is always important in times of prosperity and decline, but during the public health and economic crisis, the disparities are further highlighted. In the past two months, more than 36 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits and lower income Americans are being hit especially hard. According to research out of the University of Chicago, lower income and non-white individuals are more likely to lose their income during the first, in during the first month of the pandemic. And leaders in higher ed are currently developing solutions to support vulnerable populations and during the next 45 minutes, you will hear about specifics of supporting opportunity youth. In 2019, Kumu partnered with Cleveland State University's Center for Community Planning and Development to undertake a four month long research project to identify and inventory opportunity youth programs across the Kumu membership. This work was supported by a grant from the Annie Casey Foundation, and we are grateful for their support and are excited to host this webinar today to build upon those findings. As we move along, please utilize the chat function for questions and we'll be able to have a discussion at the end of the panelists' presentations. To get the chat started, I'm going to post brief bios of each of our panelists now. Our panelists are from three different institutions of higher education. Um, and, um, and they bring a dynamic experience um, and background to, uh, to this event. From the University of Michigan Dearborn team, we have Dean of Students, Amy Finley, and then we have Executive Director, and Assistant Director of the Office of Metropolitan Impact, Tracy Hall and Molly Manley. From the Community College of Philadelphia team, we have David Thomas, who serves as the Associate VP of Strategic Initiatives, Dean of Access and Community Engagement, and the Executive Director at the Institute of Community Engagement and Civic Leadership. And we also have Monifa Young, who is a Project Director at Community College of Philadelphia's Gateway to College program. And finally, from Temple University, we have Shirley Moy, who serves as the Executive Director of the Lenfest uh, North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative. All of our panelists have so much more that we could share about their backgrounds and accomplishments. We are thankful for that these leaders are taking some time to share their expertise with all of you. I'm now pleased to introduce our presentation team representing the University of Michigan Dearborn. Thanks for the introduction, Paul. We're excited to contribute to this Kumu webinar. I'm Dr. Tracy Hall. First, I want to share with you a quick overview of the University of Michigan Dearborn. Its characteristics are no doubt similar to many of you on this call and your institutions. In particular, I want to highlight that we have co-facilitated a Detroit-wide collaborative effort, the Detroit Opportunity Youth Collaborative, to address the needs of opportunity youth and to support their transition to and completion of two and four-year post-secondary education degrees. And we're hoping to lead a strong commitment to ground our engagement with students using trauma-informed care and restorative practices. Over the past few years or so, seven years or so, we've grown our research, practice, and policy advocacy around what we now call healing-centered restorative engagement. Molly, you can push the next slide. Healing-centered restorative engagement is not prescriptive but combines and builds on the best elements of trauma-informed care and restorative practices. Further, it approaches both sets of practices from an eco ecological perspective, something that everyone in a system, such as higher education, needs to learn about and practice, from the administrators, to the faculty, to the staff, and finally, to our students themselves. We believe the effects of trauma have to be treated like a public health crisis, and rest assured, COVID-19 is having collective and traumatic impacts on all of us. So move to the next slide, I wanna share that we assume many, if not most of our students have experienced trauma and or adverse childhood experiences, referred to as ACEs. Further, we know that youth who experience trauma are more likely to be absent from school and from work later in life. So simply put, we know that the more trauma one has experienced, the greater the likelihood they will disconnect 
from systems of opportunity like post-secondary ed. So part of our job is to create an environment where we can foster their healing and their connection to systems of well-being and where they can strengthen their resilience, growth, grit, and perseverance. perseverance. Simply put, let's go to the next slide. If you are witnessing the behaviors identified on this slide, you're witnessing evidence of trauma or adverse childhood experiences that are negatively impacting your students. Your students may be having a hard time keeping track of changes in their class, moving decisions, making decisions about their learning, being motivated to study, prioritizing assignments, engaging with classmates on subject material, managing their time. Last, they may have a very hard time not quitting. When we see these behaviors, we need to slow down and ensure, and ensure we aren't unduly triggered by their behavior and be truly conscious and open to what they're experiencing. It isn't easy, that's for sure. We simply can't make assumptions about what someone else is going through. We need to take time to prioritize connection, one-on-one -on -one relationships, which can make an enormous difference in someone's life and give them the courage to move forward productively. Next, Molly's going to share the types of healing-centered restorative engagement principles and practices we employ across the board to the extent possible. Take it, Molly. So strategies and key principles to implement healing and restorative practices include fostering emotional, intellectual, physical, and interpersonal safety. For instance, simply reaching out to students with more intentional touch points, letting them know you care, ensuring that you're addressing them by their name. Um, build trustworthiness and transparency through connection and communication by making sure students know you believe them and their experiences. Offer flexible structure and ongoing feedback. Say, I don't know when you don't know. Spell out steps required to complete assignments, for example. Intentionally facilitating peer support, such as utilizing check-in and check-out methods. Facilitate relationship building among your students. Encourage them to check up on each other when it's appropriate. And encourage storytelling and testimonials to help students progress socially and academically. You can promote collaboration and mutuality, for instance. Ask students what matters to them now, what they want to learn, what interests them. Take notes and incorporate their ideas into the communication and instructions. Empower your students with voice and choice. You might do so by empowering students who have lost a sense of control or agency to have a voice and to advocate for themselves. For example, create a short survey and ask students, how can I help you feel empowered during the, these difficult times? Identify and build on students' strengths and validate and normalize students' concerns. Pay attention to cultural, historical, and gender issues. For instance, Consider an assessment framework that is less focused on grading and more on learning. Use an intersectional, intersectional lens when considering the challenges your students are facing and work towards understanding your own default framework and biases related to teaching and learning. Last, a quick word about restorative justice and the social discipline window. As you can see here, we strive to work with students rather than do things for them or to them. For example, in the social discipline model, a good example of this would be if you have a student who's continually late for class, to do something for them, you would just continue to allow them to come late to class every day and nod it off. And when they come into class, you just say, oh, it's okay, just sit down. To do something to them in a more punitive model, you would punish them, give them detention for being late every day, and that would be the end of that. But when you're doing something with your students, in this case, you would ask them, what happened? Why are you coming late every day to class? What is it we can do together to stop this from happening? And for example, maybe the student is having difficulty opening their locker and they've been afraid to ask for help. So then you could then help them with their locker instead of punishing them. And now the problem has been solved. All this may seem a little bit basic and obvious, but it actually demands a cultural shift within our organizations in order to support our students moving toward self-actualization and family-sustaining well-being.
Okay, well, thank you, Molly. So we all know that higher education has been pretty successful in bringing opportunity youth and others to college, but we continue to struggle to get them through college. And so our institution, as uh, Tracy shared earlier, has a large population of both non, uh, excuse me, of uh, Cal eligible students, as well as first generation students, many of whom are, are both or in both categories. And so we've been thinking about this a lot. So you're looking at a slide now that talks about our engaged scholars. This is a group of students who come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds that earn a particular scholarship that's given by the institution. But what we know, and this group, by the way, in 2016 was 84% eligible, and there were 250 of them in the freshman class. And what we know is over time, this group has been approximately 10% um, behind the all student average in retention from first year to second year. And those numbers don't get better over time, despite the fact that they have significant scholarships. So we know that money is not the only issue to be solved. And so we created a program where students have to, what we call earn points, 20 per term, by engaging in educationally purposeful activities that they might not otherwise engage in, except that they want to maintain their scholarship because they understand that paying for college is important. And we've weighted those engagement opportunities by what we think is most important. So for example, academic advising is not required at our institution another conversation. But um, in this model, academic advising earns four points of the 20. So if you spend 30 minutes with an academic advisor, something I know is incredibly important and data showed us that this group of students was not seeking academic advising, you've already knocked out 20% of your points. And as you see from this side, we've provided lots and lots of different ways for students to earn points. Um, we've changed some of the point metrics. So when we used to say 20 points, now it's in hundreds, it's the same thing. And the point here is students still have agency to do what they want to do in terms of how they earn these points. And yet all of these are great opportunities and they can propose their own. And so what has this meant? This has meant a 12 on the average percent increase in our retention first to second year. And it's also brought a point four percent GPA increase over the last five years for the scholarship population. These are pretty significant numbers. It's good for the student. It builds their confidence in their ability to solve their own problems because now they know who some of the key people are. They have met with their faculty, so they now feel comfortable to engage the professors when they have a question. They've met with their academic advisor, so they understand how that process works. So they are much better able to be self-sustaining and they're starting out with a stronger GPA, which is a much better footing to be on as they progress toward graduation. Now we're an institution that most students take five to six years to graduate. So I'm really excited in the next year or two to see how um, some of the graduation metrics will play out. Okay, and we'll move on to the next piece, please. And so we've also launched a series of first generation um, college student programs. We know, again, 40% of our students are first gen and often don't know the questions to ask. And so by creating campaigns like I'm the First, where we've invited faculty, staff, and senior leadership um, to share their story about being first gen. In fact, our chancellor is a first generation college student. Two of our vice chancellors are first generation college students and a lot of our faculty are as well. So we've created a video series that we share with students and we really work to normalize uh, that first generation college student experience. We also provide pins. So some students wear these pins on their book bag. It's now seen as a point of pride as opposed to something to be embarrassed about. And we also do resource fairs, newsletters, and all kinds of other things to provide these students with the opportunity to get the information they need, the connection to other students like them, who making sure they're experienced with, ask uncomfortable questions to, and things like that. So we've done all of this in the last two years um, with great success. And again, many of these students just don't know the right questions to ask. So if we can connect them to people, we know that that um, advantages them in the long run in terms of when they have a problem, if they have a problem, they have someone to go to, and they don't just immediately say, that's it, I'm stopping out, I, I don't belong here. Okay. We also are working really hard during this time of pandemic to think about um, implications on mental health. Uh, we know that there are certain pockets of our student population for who counseling is stigmatized. So we've tried very creatively to think about how we deliver a set of wellness programs that are not specifically 
counseling, as our students describe it, right? So Zoom workshops that are around yoga or meditation or around how to live with someone 24 seven when you're in quarantine. And these programs don't require any kind of counseling intake process and are often led by our peer mentors. So students helping other students. We've been stunned by the number of students who've participated via Zoom. We've also created a YouTube channel as we are today recording. We record all of our counseling workshops so that they're available to students in an asynchronous way at two in the morning if they don't want family members to know that they're watching or at 10 in the morning if that's more convenient to them. We want our campus, whether at a distance or face-to-face, -to, -face, to be a place where all of our students feel comfortable, feel welcomed and have a home, but also understand and take advantage of the resources we have to support them, either with their mental health or with their academic or professional journey. Um, we've also been utilizing uh, workshops uh, specifically targeted for students of color, as we know the disproportionate effects of COVID-19. Okay. And I also want to point out today our student food pantry, which is about six years old. And so today we support about 250 um, clients uh, with our food pantry stocked with non-perishables, fresh food, hygiene products, cleaning products, and many of the things that students cannot access with SNAP benefits or other support programs. Uh, we work really hard to maintain dignity um, and we welcome contributions from faculty or staff um, through payroll deduction. Uh, and, and this is something that I would tell you that faculty and staff are eager to support. Okay. So in terms of specifically responding to COVID, um, we did a push out to all faculty to alert us of any student who might be struggling um, in the transition and also let us know if a student needs technology, maybe they don't have their own laptop, they can't access the Wi-Fi, we can point them to our Wi-Fi access points outdoors that they could use. Um, and also we did a push for asynchronous learning because we know that for some students, they have a lot going on at home and that is most important to them, okay? And finally, just wanna share a couple of um, resources here. Of course, as I mentioned, we have uh, some YouTube channels created with workshops. We also did something called Cooking with Cold Bath. Our uh, food pantry coordinator did a live cooking show on Facebook that showed how you can use pantry ingredients to make a delicious dinner. We had 700 watches in the first three days. And so I say this to say there are so many different ways to think about how we connect with our students and specifically opportunity youth that are on our campuses to help them to stay engaged even at a distance. And here on our slides, which I understand you'll be getting uh, later sent to you via email, we've got lots of resources that you can check out and peruse at your convenience. Thanks so much. Thank you so much to all of our presenters from the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, I think a lot of you will find what they shared extremely helpful as you um, try to support students going forward. Now I'm pleased to introduce our um, presenters from the Community College of Philadelphia team, David Thomas and Monifa Young. Good afternoon, everyone. David Thomas, Associate Vice President and Dean at Community College of Philadelphia. Ms. Young is our uh, director for our Gateway to College program. Um, and I kind of want to just give an overview of um, the programs that we have uh, at the college that specifically support opportunity youth, but I think I think more broadly, kind of how the city of Philadelphia has embraced uh, the opportunity youth population and how we as a city um, have seen this as a critical um, population of students to support. Uh, in general, uh, community colleges are built with a lot of these supports and programs in place for all of the students that would best uh, support opportunity youth. That's just very much part and parcel of the, the population of students. Uh, that typically enrolls in community colleges, particularly in rural and, and urban communities. Um, but more importantly, I think Philadelphia has kind of carved out a niche work and a whole cross-sector collaborative of individuals uh, and organizations to support opportunity youth work in Philadelphia. So the landscape in Philadelphia, specific to opportunity youth, um, and I'm just going to kind of touch on some of the larger areas, would be um, our Project U-Turn Committee, which is um, housed out of the Philadelphia Youth Network. Um, Philadelphia Youth Network is an organization in the city that pretty much gets all of the um, workforce dollars um, and other um, DHS and um, Department of Ed dollars specifically to large scale initiatives that impact young people in the city of Philadelphia. Um, housed underneath Project uh, Philadelphia Youth Network is a Project U-Turn. 
Project U-Turn is a cross-sector collaborative that houses uh, individuals from various entities in the city that are specifically focused on addressing the issues of opportunity youth. Um, one of the things that, that came out of some work, uh, research work by Bob Balfance, the Unfulfilled Promise, and there are actually about two editions of that now. Um, Bob Balfance is out of John Hopkins University, and he's focused a lot of his work on the plight of opportunity youth, particularly in Philadelphia. Um, and that is actually what raised the awareness specific to our work in the city to actually inform Project U-Turn. Um, and one of the things we found is that there are many states, many cities um, that were looking at dropout prevention, but not many that were looking at re-engagement. Um, so Philadelphia actually took the work of re-engaging dropout students. Um, this was before they were called opportunity youth. So you can kind of see I'm dating myself, but we've been in this work for quite some time in Philadelphia to figure out how can we re-engage them and get them back on track. So again, Project U-Turn kind of guides that work in the city. Um, out of the work that Project U-Turn has been doing over the years, uh, Philadelphia actually has in its school district an opportunity network. Um, at one point, I don't know if this is still the case, but at one point we were the only school district um, nationally that actually had its own network that was focused on schools, programs, and support for opportunity youth. Um, and that was a really, really good move for the city of Philadelphia in that it raised the issues, the concerns, and the needs of opportunity youth to a cabinet level position in the district um, where our school board was familiar with it, where the superintendent was regularly familiar with it. They weren't just side programs that were, that were created and set aside and um, to address small populations of students, but really we kind of saw the needs of opportunity youth at a much larger scale to address them. Um, additionally, our mayor has uh, in his strategic plan, fueling Philadelphia's talent engine, um, has a very, very clearly defined focus um, on opportunity youth um, and not just getting them to and through school, but getting them into the workforce, getting them credentialed um, and addressing all of those needs that we know impact opportunity youth. And then the last two, and these are not the only two partners that I'll mention, but there are also some of the private partners or other separate charter school partners and entities that exist. Um, our Youth Build Philadelphia Charter School, many of you may be aware of Youth Build um, America. Um, it's a large organization that supports opportunity youth um, and also the E3 centers, um, employment, I think it's education, employment and empowerment centers that exist in various corners of the city of Philadelphia to address the needs of opportunity. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, at, again, I said at CCP, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is the fact that we are pretty much wall to wall supports for students. Again, that just is um, part and parcel of how community colleges are set up and designed. Um, so the predominant work that we have um, specific to uh, opportunity youth are typically um, related to getting students to and through their high school diploma and credential. Um, so uh, through dual enrollment programs, our primary goal to support our opportunity youth is to create a supported opportunity for those students to experience college early, earn credits, and enhance their chances for enrollment retention and completion. And some of the ways that we do that, um, and this is kind of like uh, tenets through all of our programs, are work experiences, vo vocational work experience, where we actually find placements for those students, paid internships, and we pay for those students. Ms. Young can probably talk a little bit more about that later. Um, career and tech ed programs that we offer short stackable credentials for these individuals so that they can get something and be employable while they're also working on, on their um, degree or diploma. Um, we're big on bridge programs, understanding that many of them are first generation, not only um, college, many are first generation high school in their families and needing those supports. Um, and then of course, the general wraparound and case management, which I don't personally believe you can have enough of those supports for any student. Um, and I'm not going to read these slides to you, but again, this is kind of an overview of some of the programs that we have, our Gateway to College program, again, a national program that Ms. Young can talk a little bit more about. Um, some of the specific ones and special ones that we have, our Helms Academy Adult High School, it's a partnership program that exists in the city of Philadelphia. Temple University is also one of our partners where we work with students um, who've been out of school for quite some time to earn their, high, their Commonwealth credential um, by taking college credits. Um, and two special programs that we've also had funded, um, a special summer program, bridge program that addresses the needs of opportunity youth, 
our ACE Plus program and our conveyor belt program, which also is a collaborative of other partners in the city that support opportunity to get students to and through. And I'll talk a little bit more about two of those programs as we talk about that a little later. So um, this next slide again, talks a little bit about some of the data from those programs. Um, our conveyor belt program, which was actually privately funded by a uh, few organizations in the past, we have now four full years of data. Um, and that program literally has been a tremendous help for students that are in various support programs across the city that support the needs of opportunity youth. So as you see, we've, we've seen students be able to not only earn credits in a traditional sense, um, but they've also earned credits in a supported sense. Um, they, in conveyor belt, those students are cohorted. They're taking classes together in an entire year long experience. Um, and here are just some of the data. We see that students are earning roughly 12 college credits a year. Now, mind you, these are students that are not fully enrolled in college. These are students who are dually enrolled. They're in high schools, they're in GED and high set programs, but they're also taking college classes at the same time. And our gateway to college data, I just pulled out some basic data from our 18, 19 school year. Um, 141, 106 of those students out of 141 were retained for one full year and they earned uh, over 804 college credits. And then the average at the um, bottom was a few years of our developmental ed, um, English and math pass rates for students in their first semester. So kind of what this is the thing that I think resonates most with me. We want to know what students are saying about their experiences. Um, and here, uh, I just have these up, you can read through them, but I'll talk about a few, few themes that we find out when we engage our opportunity youth in experiences and in programs um, at the college. Some of the things that resonate with them is the fact that they were really, really thankful at having an early experience and a supported experience. They were happy to know what it meant to, what it was like to read a syllabus and to um, have to show up to class on time and you know what it means to have a course in a semester as opposed to a year. And to be able to get that in a supported environment and a program that allowed them to somewhat kind of dip their toe in the water of college before they had to dive completely in was very, very helpful for them. Um, and it really kind of eased the transition from being in secondary school to post-secondary or very often being in secondary school at one point, not being in school at all for sometimes a year to several years to being back in school, uh, but now being in college. Um, but creating that sort of bridge experience that has been really, really supportive for students. So those are just some of the general quotes um, that we've gotten from some of our students. Um, and then what I'll ask Ms. Young to do now is kind of talk more specifically about how we've had to pivot um, in the midst of COVID to provide supports to students. Um, she's on the ground all day working with our students, uh, her, she and her team. Um, and I think she's done some really, really remarkable work to kind of make sure that in the midst of this virtual pandemic that's happening where we have to only talk to students via email only talk to students via zoom how she's been able to pivot her team to meet the needs of our students sure um yes one other theme um with the dual enrollment population is that all of our programs have a an intensive case management model so we're really hands-on with our students and specifically with gateway um, our students are assigned to an academic coordinator who serves as their guidance counselor, advisor, you know, therapist, anything that they need um, and helps address their academic, social, emotional and college and career planning um, in our program. So some of the things that we've done um, while, you know, we're experiencing the COVID closures is we have continued our one-on-one -on -one weekly meetings with students. They have mandatory meetings with us, um, but daily we call, we text, we email, we use social media um, to connect with them um, to address the digital divide. Um, we facilitated um, distributing uh, loaner laptops from the college as well as Chromebooks um, as issued through the school district. So we've ensured that 100% of our students received a Chromebook or laptop. And the next phase is um, hotspots are going out probably um, next week since our program is year round. We've also sent care packages, just, you know, thinking about you cards, um, little boredom busters, you know, um, puzzles and, you know, um, different things to engage them. And so, um, you know, we find that through these efforts, our school district wide has had the most um, 
one of the you know most successful engagement um student engagement of all of the schools throughout all of this so we have you know narrowed it from quite a few students who we didn't hear from to now three that we're still trying to track down so students are engaged they're earning credits they're feeling supported and we're also doing you know extracurricular things with them game day, paint nights, anything to keep them engaged because they're used to our family environment on campus. So we're just trying to translate that in a virtual kind of way so that they still feel the love and the support to be able to continue making progress academically. Thank you very much for uh, Monifa and David for sharing um, their work at Community College of Philadelphia. Now I'm pleased to introduce our final presenter for the afternoon, Shirley Moy out of Temple University. So um, thank you to my colleagues that presented before me. I think uh, David did a great job explaining the context of Philadelphia. So for folks that had the opportunity to come to the Kumu conference in the background of this picture, you'll see Center City and Temple is just about a mile and a half north of the Center City campus. Um, again, my name is Shirley Moy. I serve as the Lenfest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative Director. I've been with the university for 20, more than 20 years, um, but this initiative was funded by the Lenfest Foundation, which gave us uh, about two and a half million for this current year uh, to do the work that we're doing. Um, and the work that the Lenfest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative seeks to do is to really focus on the external community surrounding Temple University um, and to support residents in um, finding sustainable employment uh, by providing different training and service programs through a network of 20 organizations. So the money that we received to the LenFest Foundation, we uh, supported community university partnerships to offer a variety of services and programs. So what we say about North Philadelphia, this is how Temple University has traditionally described North Philadelphia, which is the eight zip code surrounding the university. Um, which is comprised Philadelphia. We know Philadelphia is a, is a city of different neighborhoods. Um, main campus is located in 19122 and Temple University's hospital is in 19140. Um, and so we're encompassing a pretty large area. This represents about 18% of the city's population. And um, there's lots of data on this community. Uh, the average age for this community is 30. So it's just slightly older than what the cutoff rate would be opportunity youth. So uh, when we devised the strategy for the LenFest North Philadelphia Workforce Initiative, we did a whole bunch of data um, mining through the census and other kinds of economic development data, but we also wanted to um, have conversations with the local residents um, and ask them what do they see as barriers to employment and advancement. And so see, these are some of the thematic responses that came out of what we call table talks. We had a series of them going to public housing, going to different schools, um, meeting with uh, religious and faith-based leaders in different community groups. And you can see here that there's a lot of issues regarding transportation, digital literacy, housing security, the benefits cliff, and I'm happy to go into more detail what these each mean, but um, we, we'll go forward. So um, when Paul and Kubo asked us to talk about the programs that we have youth, it's really based on our understanding of what is the challenges in Philadelphia, particularly North Philadelphia. And I think Community College did a great job uh, talking about what the, some of the city initiatives are. For us at Temple University, which is a state-related university, um, there was this idea that uh, we needed to provide opportunities, uh, opportunities for youth to get into internships, whether paid or not paid. Uh, go into paid work experience and summer work programs. And so they're targeting both high school youth and opportunity youth. And again, like CCP, we're talking about opportunity youth that don't have their high school diploma um, or and or they have their high school diploma but are not uh, engaged in any formal education or employment. And so for our issues in developing this internship, so we had a network of a lot of organizations approaching Temple University about doing internships at the university and at the hospital. It became a little overwhelming. So what we're trying to do or have done is kind of create a coordinated response to all those requests to create these internships. And so we're working with different referral agencies um, and we ended up uh, providing a person that is full-time at the hospital that will coordinate internship experiences for um, organizations that are for directed for youth. Um, so as you can imagine, if to do all that, that requires, you know, establishing eligibility requirements and paperwork, especially if they're under the age of 18 and getting parents to sign off, that can be quite a hurdle given COVID-19. 
trying to do all that virtually. Um, in that kind of opportunity, we really want you to explore the careers. I mean, I'm sure you all experience when you talk to a person about what a career is in um, healthcare, they think of doctors and nurses, but they really don't understand the breadth of what's really available to them. So that's part of what we're trying to do is afford them a, an understanding of what careers mean in different healthcare and other related fields. Um, for the internships, I think, you know, um, having placed some at the hospital and other places within the university, it really does become important that there are quality experiences. Sometimes people refer to, um, you know, not just preparing young people for folding or filing or dealing with cleanups, but really giving them a more career oriented experience. And that means that we need to really work with the supervisors and mentors and on site coordinators so they understand that the assignments that are given them, it's really intended to give them more, not only work experiences, but also kind of a career exposure related to that. I know one of the things in terms of a hospital that ended up happening for um, Temple University is that they did not want to take children um, under the age of 18 for liability issues. And so that became a challenge um, and that we're still trying to work through some of that to allow some of the high school, younger high school students to be able to get those experiences. And I think the other thing that came up for us in terms of a hospital-based internship was actually union approval. So at the Temple Hospital is District 1190C Training and Upgrading Fund. Um, those were some of the positions that these interns were uh, taking on some responsibilities related to those things. And the union leadership was okay with it. It was actually the union members that had concerns because they felt like they were taking away the extra hours that they could earn and then, then it therefore affecting their income. So that was kind of an interesting uh, dynamic that happened that we wasn't expected. Um, some of the other programs like um, CCP, we are, do have programs for young people ages 16 to 24 that are basic skills deficiency, meaning that their numer numeracy and literacy skills are below level. Um, we do have programs. We work with, as um, David says, we work with them on the Helms Academy. Um, this is actually really interesting because our partnership is with the Goodwill industry of Southern New Jersey and Philadelphia, which is actually paying for the college credits. So it's not any out of pocket that the student has to do. Um, they don't necessarily qualify for um, financial aid, but with the collaboration with um, CCP and Goodwill and Temple and Drexel, uh, being able to provide these people with an opportunity to earn college credits toward their high school diploma, that's really exciting. Um, and I think the other thing that we're seeing, particularly with COVID-19, is this really digital literacy divide. Um, I think this generation is very phone savvy, um, without a doubt, but their uh, computer savviness in a work environment is, uh, could be strengthened. There are, similarly to everybody that shared, there are programs for youth to explore career in college. Um, I do would say that I just want to point out some of the ones that we are really uh, invested in. And um, I think one of my colleagues is actually a participant, Harold Brooks, who runs a program that uh, is educational focused for youth aging out of foster care. We've been involved in that for over 30 decades, over 30 years, um, and we provide the educational support for that. Um, which involves helping people with college applications and tours and FAFSA and scholarships, um, an overnight so, uh, summer camp, college week, and all those things that will help uh, folks that are first generation college students or, uh, or challenged that, like they're in foster care um, to give them those extra things that maybe their family or community can't provide. And um, similarly, I would say the other things that the university is looking at um, and what we provide are kind of industry recognized certification that can lead to employment um, and not necessarily a, a degree or a bachelor's degree. And so finally, in terms of uh, some considerations for institutions of higher education that are wanting to uh, continue to do the work they do or expand the work they do with Opportunity Youth is that, you know, in Pennsylvania, there is a, a minorities uh, campus policy that had to be developed in response to sexual abuse allegations that um, I would say started out at Penn State. But got, uh, so there's a lot of issues that need to be worked out. The university developed some policies. You have to register your program well in advance. You have to get everybody that is volunteering or associated with youth to all do all the clearances, which is the state, the federal, um, and the child abuse clearances, which can take a lot of time. And the issues about who pays for it became a a kind of a thing. I would say the one thing I love about our youth program or Temple University as probably the other universities too is that there really is a passion 
between a lot of departments on campus to um, be involved in this work. And so when we do college week or um, college campus and career exposures, all the departments are open, come um, with open arms to support the programs from the law school to the dental school, to the medical school, to um, public health. It's just really overwhelming how um, engaged they are and willing they are to volunteer to do those kinds of things. Um, divert, you know, we always, uh, I think the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion also applies to our staff. Our staff is very diverse and I think that helps with those relationships with the young people. I think uh, the first presenter did a great job on what positive youth development and trauma-informed practice means. Um, and then there's an issue of sustainability. I would say all the projects that are running, that we run, that are youth focused are sponsored projects. In other words, we find funding for them to support the work. And I know um, that because of COVID-19, some of those funding opportunities are shrinking. So we applied for a grant that was workforce related from the state. And we just got notification this week that they're pulling those funding. They're gonna keep the application on file should the funding become available, but they're pulling the funding to pay for COVID-19 expenditures. Um, Paul also asked us to talk about what does it mean for challenges and um, for COVID-19. And the digital divide is very real. Uh, so one of the things that I know that um, uh, CCP talked about loans to for laptops. What we ended up doing at Temple is working with Temple's Computer Recycling Center. They had computers that you know get cycled out of the uh, main campus that's made available. So they actually gifted us 200 computers, which we are able to share with our community partners to give to folks that wanted to do stuff virtually but just didn't have the technology access. And so uh, we are continuing to do that um, to make those computers available for folks. You know, we could move people to personal uh, from personal to virtual, but again, you know, that experience can be less ideal than a personal contact. Um, social distancing regulations. Um, there's a summer work ready program that we have where you have to collect paperwork, and some of that stuff has to be curbside pickup and all those kinds of things that need to be in place for safety reasons. Um, and I think in terms of our summer work experience, I mean, normally we would probably have 100 kids ready to go into a summer experience come July, but all that has to be thought through and um, trying to see whether we can move any of that virtually and finding willing employers and mentors who would be able to do that on a virtual basis. These are some of the um, resources that David referred to, the Philadelphia Youth Network and Project U-Turn that's in Philadelphia. Um, and then if you have any questions, that's uh, um, all I am available. Thank you very much, Shirley, for sharing um, for, for your presentation. We now have about uh, 15 minutes for question and answer time. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna all be visible in a second. Uh, so please feel free to use the chat function um, for any questions that you may have. You can also utilize the raising the hand and we can unmute you if you would like to ask a specific question um, to one of the panelists that just presented um, over the past 45 minutes. I have one that I, I'd like to get started really from any of you that, um, that would like to answer it. So you all spoke a bit about um, how you're addressing certain challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. I guess, um, how do you see a lot of these things being sustainable as we move into the fall or like what other uncertainties do you think may crop up um, in the next couple months with some of these supports? Um, I can chime in. Uh, so I think someone said at one point, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. So what I can say is uh, at our institution, some, some things that have come out are we've streamlined some processes and did some things um, in record time that literally folks said, had been saying for the last 10 years, it can't be done, it can't, you know. So trying to document those things and then making sure that you keep it a running tab of what's being done better. Um, I think in Pennsylvania right now, and this is probably the case in most states, um, you have to go by what the governor and your local mayor and authorities are saying. So even though we're trying to plan for fall and we're planning institutions, we're planning for fall now, mm -hmm. we know that what today's reality is could be something different tomorrow. And um, how are we now thinking about whether we're going to be fully online in fall or face to face in fall? And if we decide to now do fully online and we're enrolling students fully online now, 
But then one week after the semester begins, we're now able to open back up again. What do you do? Do you transition? Do you pivot? Do you do the same thing that you had to do this spring, which for us was not ideal to go from face to face to online? Do you now switch from online to face to face? So all of those sorts of things we're still trying to, I think, iron out and then be able to communicate that to students and partners and stakeholders in a way where they kind of understand it and get it and can therefore plan their own future around our still somewhat uncertain future. Yeah, I would I would chime in as well, and I would agree 100% with what was just said. But I would add also that I think we we moved to this mode a little bit begrudgingly because there was no choice. And what we're finding is some of the things that we said well, this really is not ideal, but this is what we have, have turned out to be a blessing in disguise. And some of the online programs that are now running asynchronously might be a vehicle for some of our opportunity youth when we do return to whatever version of, you know, face-to-face -face normal, because maybe because of their competing um, demands on their life, you know, working part-time and family responsibilities and otherwise, they're not going to come to the student union to attend in person for a workshop. So maybe having a website available to them where they can go click on the link at one in the morning and watch the broadcast, well, maybe that's really great for them. And maybe this gives us the opportunity to think differently and more inclusively about how we're serving our students. We weren't doing that six months ago in this way. Of course, we were well-intended and doing the best that we could, but um, we too are trying not to let this crisis go to waste. I would just say, continue to say, but that digital literacy divide, while some of our programs were able to continue virtually, not everybody could actively participate in those kinds of environments. Not Just one, not having the computer or the internet access, but then also the idea of how to use this technology in a way that they're not used to. And so um, I think that it presents a challenge that there is a digital literacy strategy that needs to be in place if you know this continues longer. If it doesn't and you're allowed to um, regain um, the opportunity to meet for, uh, in person, I know for us, that requires us to maybe um, lower the size of participants in our classroom and offer more cohorts of them. So instead of having one cohort of 25, it might be two cohorts of 12, which increases the cost because you have to offer it twice, but it improves this, um, the social distancing rules. Some of the challenges um, that I anticipate still being a challenge is um, in addressing students' um, mental health. Um, students were having mental health challenges before COVID. And so now just, you know, trying to get them to understand that um, this is temporary, you know, we're not going to be operating and working remotely forever, you know, and so um, supporting them through that and just supporting them through the reality of, you know, some of their homes are not the ideal place to be. So, you know, while, professors, you know, are have these expectations and the school district has expectations of what, you know, students should be accomplishing. Um, several students are living in households with a lot of people, a lot of people online, you know, a lot of people who have Zoom meetings at the same time, you know, internet is slow. We have a student who he and his brother, because of their financial struggles, he and his brother have to share a phone. So when we call for our weekly meeting, you know, we have to coordinate that around his brother's time on the cell phone. So these are real things that our students are dealing with. Um, and also, you know, just with the many cases of COVID in Philly, you know, we've had students who have been sick and we've had students who've had to stay with other relatives because their parents were sick or other members in their household were sick. So, um, you know, as the Dean mentioned, we've come up with ways to address some of the, um, you know, technical things on campus that we needed to address, but um, now added to that a layer of addressing students' mental health um, to make sure that, you know, they know that this is temporary and that um, this is something that none of us have ever experienced. And so we're all trying to figure it out. Um, you know, and just uh, learn learn as we go. Thank you all for chiming in on that question. We just received a question into our chat box and um, the question states, are folks expecting an explosion in the number of opportunity, opportunity youth over the next year? 
are we prepared are, are we prepared to engage more young people and then i'm going to hand it off to tracy first she started to type it but then so everyone can uh <laughs> can can hear what she had to type Pick me, pick me. I'm really enthusiastic about this question, not because, well, first, Wes, I completely believe the numbers nationally of opportunity youth are going to skyrocket. The last, the first people to suffer are vulnerable populations when there's an economic crisis or an economic meltdown. So we can absolutely expect that those who haven't connected economically or haven't connected to post-secondary ed are going to be hit badly. So what that means for a lot of us is figuring out what are those support structures and systems for reaching out and connecting because one caring adult can make the difference, right? So we know that from a trauma-informed perspective and a restorative practices perspective, I'm really encouraged to see that AmeriCorps programming is dramatically being proposed as an option. And so for those of you who aren't using AmeriCorps programming, please get online. I can... Um, put some references in the chat box when I'm done talking um, that can lead you to some of these proposals, but they're talking about increasing the numbers of AmeriCorps slots by hundreds of thousands. I'll uh, think about the Great Depression when people were put to work in the federal, you know, federally funded work opportunities so that people could grow their skills, grow their talent, get schooling while the depression wasn't employing them. So the stipends are gonna be dramatically increased if these proposals are approved. The slots are going to provide two years of post-secondary education in public institutions. So institutions like ours, which is a public institution, could actually get two years of education award for each person who serves in an AmeriCorps program. This is also going to be directed at folks who can do contact tracing. So if you are willing to run an AmeriCorps program, where students could be taking, let's say, 12 credits while they're doing a 20 hour a week contact tracing responsibility as an AmeriCorps member, they're gonna get a stipend to live on, which we know all of our OY are desperately gonna need money to live on. So a stipend to live on, access to SNAP benefits, and they get the education award, and they're going to school and getting training and while this is going on. So I strongly encourage you guys to be thinking about that as an option and to be contacting your legislators to encourage them to include these new legislative proposals into any of the next COVID-related funding um, mechanisms that are coming through Congress. There was another question from uh, to all of the panelists, so whoever would like to answer it, it says, um, how are you partnering outside the campus with nonprofits public systems and, and philanthropy to support opportunity youth. So I think some of this was shared, but um, any any other additional information would be great. So I, I can jump into and start. Um, at the college we have, and again, I feel like our institution, and this is the nature of community colleges, like, you know, we kind of been looking at supporting this population of student long before it was even termed opportunity youth. So a lot of those supports already exist. But we have, under my area and out of our president's office, convened what we call a Wellness Partners Consortium. Um, and it really is a focus on pulling in all of the partner organizations in the city of Philadelphia, whether it be philanthropy, you know, the nonprofits, um, to come together around the, con the concept of wellness and how we can make sure that our students are well as they move through. Um, our belief system is our students are your clients, your clients are often our students. How do we overlay those supports? How do we make sure that funding is blended in a way where students are getting the most out of what we offer and the most out of what you all can offer? Um, we have those conversations on a monthly basis. Right now, we're actually moving our conversations to a virtual platform where we can continue to have these discussions. Um, the question right now everywhere is, how are you navigating this to support your students? How are you navigating this to support your constituents? How are you navigating this to support your, you name it? So that's a common thing that's happening in general conversations and very, very formal conversations. We want to kind of pull it together uh, and be a resource for each other and also be a wealth of, I think, information for one another. What we've found is that some of our partners um, are doing things very uniquely. Um, and we're like, oh, we can do that. That makes sense, you know, or they're saying the same thing. Oh, wow, we never thought about that. We could do the same thing. So again, utilizing um, all of the partners as a wealth of resources so that we can best make sure that the gap for opportunity youth, uh, and there are already numerous gaps, far too many, making sure that we can fill those gaps in together as a web uh, in a network. 
I'd like to build on that too. At, at Temple, we have this opportunity for a workforce leadership committee, which um, is comprised of the 20 organizations that we support plus others. Um, so they're nonprofits. It's uh, West represents the foundation and there's public agencies. But I think what it is, is that having those spaces where it's not competitive and you can collaborate and you can find those relationships that build on each other, then you can expand what's really offering. An example would be, you know, we had before the Lenfest Foundation, we didn't have this, we had a relationship with Philadelphia Housing Authority, but because of this grant, you know, they were able to build out a stick room for our construction related training program. We provided the training. So all these things come together where you can leverage resources and each other's asset for the common good. To add to all of that, I would just like to share something that I've been doing that's a little less formal than the other examples, but um, our office, Office of Metropolitan Impact, has a lot of relationships within community. And during this time of COVID, I've been a lot more intentional about maintaining those relationships and reaching out to our partners that we work with regularly, asking them what's going on with them. Is there anything that we can share for them? Um, is there anything that they have that they would like to share with us for our students? And in those conversations, I think um, even though it's been informal conversations, it's built a lot of uh, trust. And because of that, we've been able to do things like identify the fact that where I'm at currently located at right now, there's a large undocumented population in DACA students. And many of them had needs that were going unaddressed because they didn't feel comfortable stepping forward to share those needs. Um, but once they were shared, we were easily able to identify with a nonprofit partner um, that they had the resources to give them to get them what they needed. And then other students that or youth who wanted to go into the university or community college this come fall felt overwhelmed by all the systems going on right now and everything being closed down. They didn't know who to reach out to. They had questions. They didn't know if they should even be going to school still. And we're planning on maybe not even attending college. Um, we were able to connect them and make them feel comfortable with, you know, our relationships at the university and on campus. Um, whereas otherwise, if we didn't have those close connections with our community partners in a more informal way, those youth would have never been comfortable coming forward and sharing their concerns with us. And they probably would have ended up just staying home. Our hour is already up. I just, I think it flew by. I hope that everybody um, found the presentations helpful and can bring some of this information back to your own campuses and your own position. Um, we will be able to stay on for a couple minutes if there are any lingering questions, but um, if you have to go, um, we just want, I want to express my appreciation to all the panelists. I think um, they all brought a different angle of how to best support Opportunity Youth, and um, the next few months and year ahead are going to be quite challenging as we all um, address the COVID-19 pandemic and then the economic implications that it's leading to. So um, I think this work is is always important, but right now it's it even some of the some of the work is even more important than it's ever been. So I just um, want to thank everybody for joining and the panelists for for providing some information uh, for all of you all today. I do want to check with all of the panelists to see if anyone had um, just any closing comments that they'd like to share with the rest of the group. Uh, now be a great time to to do that. I'm going to go first. I feel like I'm always going first. <laughs> go, Shirley. I saw you about to say something. No, I was just going to answer that question is, um, you know, the University of Temple provides the our space, the room over our head, and all the infrastructure, but we are surviving on sponsor projects. Yeah, I'll, I'll underscore that. By and large, we are as well, too. It's not always a grant. Sometimes it's a third party contract that you have in partnership with a particular program. Um, but again, I think um, the nature of community colleges, a lot of the things that very that many other institutions may have grant funded are kind of like built into what we do. So we've always had a food pantry. Like we've got those sorts of things that are just built into our general operating budget. Um, but specific programming very often like a gateway to college program that Ms. Young manages is actually a third-party contract with the district. And I'll just add a closing comment which is like um, I am concerned about funding and so I am glad that there are philanthropists on the on the presentation but in terms of government funding and the impact of what's happening financially and seeing that some of the state and federal funding are being pulled back 
for awards it that for proposals that were already submitted is kind of like uh, uh, foretelling. And so, you know, the role of philanthropy would be huge, I think, uh, and, and critically important. Yes, I underscore that, Shirley. It's, it's, it's critical right now for us to think uniquely about how we can like braid funding and find funding, like even with the CARES Act funding that came out um, initially before, you know, some set of lawyers got to it. Hopefully I'm not offending any lawyers that may be on this, but you can clearly tell some lawyers got to it at first and kind of rethought how it should really be rolled out. So it came back with a set of restrictions that really did not take into account, I think a lot of the populations that were negatively impacted by this sort of eliminated the way we could really um, kind of like disperse the dollars for some individuals. So the role of uh, philanthropy is always critical, but even like, I think, more critical at this point to kind of really think through how we can lessen the impact on, on students. I think we got all of our questions answered, but I do want to, I know a lot of people have had to sign off, but I do want to encourage everybody to reach out and keep this conversation going. I think a lot of things may be, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things may change in the next coming weeks and months. So it's important to continue to uh, make sure to stay up to date on current funding opportunities and just different ways to support young people as they, as we all try to address um, challenges that, that are coming our way. Um, so thank you all for taking the time and uh, please reach out to, to me or any of the panelists with questions that you may think of later. We'd be happy to get back to you and, and continue this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.